Hello, my name is Dr. Andrew Dauber, and I am currently the Chief of Endocrinology at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Today, I will be speaking about genetic advances in understanding short stature and novel therapeutic approaches. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. These are my disclosures. Most relevant, I will be talking about some research uh, that I am conducting with a drug called Asoratide, and that study is funded by Biomarin, but it is an investigator-initiated study, and the company plays no role in the design or conduct of the study. So today, we're first going to talk about the spectrum of genetic variants that affect height. We're then going to recognize a few important genetic causes of short stature that affect the growth plate, such as agarcan and NPR2, and the potential for novel therapeutic approaches. And finally, we're going to discuss the yield of genetic testing and the diagnosis of short stature. So when I think about factors that influence a person's height, there are many things taken into consideration. Of course, on the right, you see the environment. Uh, nutrition plays an important role. Children who are significantly undernourished will not grow well. Psychosocial stress can impact growth, as well as medications. So pictured here is a bottle of growth hormone but uh, other medications such as glucocorticoids can stunt growth. On the bottom is a picture of a patient with untreated congenital hypothyroidism to remind us that many chronic illnesses can affect growth and these could have both genetic as well as environmental causes. In the top is a picture of the in utero environment, reminding us that this in utero environment can have significant impacts on both short-term and long-term growth, including epigenetic effects, but today we're gonna to focus on the genetic factors. So within any given population, it's known that approximately 80 to 90% of the variation in height is due to genetic factors. And traditionally, this is how endocrinologists have been taught to think about growth. We have the pituitary gland, which produces growth hormone. Growth hormone goes to the liver, produces IGF-1, where it then goes to the bone. And there's this thing called the growth plate, which to many of us is a black box that we don't think too much about. And if we're being a little more sophisticated, we know that growth hormone has direct effects at the growth plate as well, that are both IGF-1 independent and that IGF-1 is bound in complexes. And under that black box, we know there are these chondrocytes that grow and proliferate and differentiate to make the bones grow longer in a process called endochondral ossification. But for many of us, uh, I think there are two stories that really characterize the diagnostic and therapeutic approach in the growth hormone era. And the first story is that of the man who's walking down the street and he sees another man down on his hands and knees, apparently searching for something. And the first man says, oh, my friend, did you lose something? And he says, yes, I dropped my keys. So this first man says, well, I'm gonna help you where, I'll help you look for them. Is this where you dropped your keys? And he says, no, actually I dropped my keys down the block over there. So he says, of course, well, if you dropped your keys down the block, why are you looking here? And the man replies, well, this is where the light is. And I think that's very appropriate in that as endocrinologists, we specialize in hormones. And for many years, we've learned a lot about how to measure growth hormone, how to stimulate it, how to measure IGF-1 and igf bb 3 and other biomarkers. And as a result, we think about evaluating for growth in that light. Is this a hormonal problem? In this is where our knowledge lies. And of course, the second adage is when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And for many years, our only uh, therapeutic approach for children with short stature was essentially to treat them with growth hormone. And thus we thought of every patient as are you growth hormone deficient or resistant? You know, where are you on that spectrum? But what I would like to posit is that in the last decade or more, the power of genomics has led to a whole new understanding of growth biology. And this, we're not gonna go into details, but this is the output of one of the more recent genome-wide association studies, which showed that there are literally thousands of different genes involved in growth. And there's common genetic variation at hundreds if now probably thousands of loci, different regions across the genome that influence height in the general population. And when you, are able to ident identify these thousands of genes, you can start look at all, looking at all of the different pathways involved in growth. And you start to see that, yes, there are many different um, pathways 
Of course, the growth hormone and IGF signaling shows up, but many of these pathways are involved in the bones themselves and especially in biology at the growth plate. And a new concept has been emerging as well that there is a range of effect of the different genetic variants in these genes and pathways where you might have mild polymorphisms that affect height by just a few millimeters in the general population. You could have less severe mutations or variants um, that lead to what looks like isolated or idiopathic short stature and more severe mutations that lead to skeletal dysplasias. And on the flip side, you can have mutations with opposing effects that might actually lead to tall stature. So here's just one example of that. This is a zoom in of uh, genome-wide association data. And you see there's this gene in the middle called ACAN or AGRICAN. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but this is one of the most associated regions in the entire genome with height. And there are multiple independent signals, each of which uh, are having an effect on height in the general population. And these are common genetic variants having small effects. But this brings me to a series of families that back now almost 10 years ago, um, we did exome sequencing on, and these were three families. And what was notable about them was they all had familial short stature in where the short stature was inherited in a dominantly inherited fashion. So it was inherited one of the parents, one of the sides of the family had a short stature, and the children all had advanced bone ages. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the concept of a bone age x-ray that looks at the growth plates in the hand to see how mature they are. And most of the time when you evaluate for somebody for short stature, they have delayed bone ages or perhaps their bone age is equivalent to their chronologic age. It would be very unusual to be short and have an advanced bone age. And the affected individuals had a range of short stature between minus two and minus four standard deviations. Their bone ages were advanced between one and a half and four years, and they had early growth cessation. So two of the mothers reported stopping growing before they had menarche, which is not a normal sequence of events. And they had negative endocrine evaluation. So there was no hormonal etiology for why their bone age was advanced. They didn't have androgen excess or estrogen excess. And one of the families had early onset osteoarthritis with osteochondritis desiccans. And it turns out that when we did exome sequencing, all three families had heterozygous loss of function mutations in the agrican gene. Agrican encodes for a proteoglycan. It's found in the extracellular matrix uh, in cartilage around those chondrocytes, uh, both in the growth plate and on articular surfaces. Um, and prior to us reporting this in 2014, there were three families in the world who were ever described with agrican gene mutations, and each of them had their own skeletal dysplasia named after them. So now we're starting to appreciate that you don't necessarily have to have that severe skeletal dysplasia, but rather, you could have uh, a milder form of what looks like idiopathic or isolated short stature inherited in this dominant fashion. And in these initial three families with an advanced bone age. Well, moving on, we then went and expanded our cohort over the next three years to 103 mutation positive individuals from 20 different families and around 40, 40 to 50% of them had significant joint disease uh, associated with the short stature and their mutations all throughout the gene. And we found that as you expand that spectrum of mutations, that not all of the patients have as significant short stature and not all of them have severely advanced bone age. And in fact, there have now even been patients with clearly pathogenic aggregate mutations who had delayed bone ages. So, Advanced bone age is a clue, or a lack of delay is definitely a clue to this etiology, but it is not always found. In multiple other groups, these are just two of the papers about agrican gene mutations. The top one looked at children born SGA with advanced bone age, and 14% of them had agrican mutations, all of which were inherited in a dominant fashion. The second was looking at patients with short stature and brachydactyly. Um, and 16 patients were found with agrican mutations. Again, all of them 
following that dominantly inherited pattern with one parent with short stature. So that's definitely another uh, clue. And there have now been hundreds and hundreds of patients identified, if not thousands, with agrican gene mutations. So um, I, along with uh, colleagues, uh, conducted a trial, a prospective trial of growth hormone therapy in patients with agrican gene mutations. Uh, this was funded by Novo Nordisk, and we presented the data uh, at, the at the Pediatric Endocrine Society in the U.S. in 2021, and actually the first year data has now been published in JCM, showing that uh, there is a short-term increase in growth velocity in patients with agrican gene mutations. It does seem to fall off a bit in the second year, but we do not have any good reliable data on how this changes final height outcome in these patients. Now we're gonna zoom into that growth plate a little bit more. And on the left here, you see a histologic section of the growth plate, the resting zone where the stem cells of the chondrocyte reside, the proliferative zone where more copies are made, they line up in columns and then get to the hypertrophic zone where they hypertrophy and start producing more components of the extracellular matrix, which then eventually forms new bone through this process called endochondral ossification. And in the top right, we zoom in even further on a single chondrocyte. And I want to draw your attention to a few pathways here. So in the top left is the FGFR3 gene. That is the fibroblast growth factor receptor type 3. This is the gene that has activating mutations leading to achondroplasia, which is the most common cause of dwarfism. Also, mutations cause hypochondroplasia. And when you have mutations in there, it signals through a few pathways. But if you go down to the right, you see that RAS, RAF, MEK, MAP kinase pathway, also called the ERK pathway, which inhibits chondrocyte hypertrophy and, and subsequent growth of the growth plate. In the top right, so FGFR3 is acting like a break to growth at the growth plate. In the top right, you have what's called CNP or C-type natriuretic peptide. And CNP binds to its receptor encoded by the NPR2 gene, and it opposes that downstream pathway, thereby lifting the break and promoting growth of the chondrocyte. And back in 2004, it was found that individuals who have recessive mutations in NPR2 have a significant skeletal dysplasia called acromesal dysplasia maritotype. Um, so this is a very rare skeletal dysplasia, and you can see this severe short stature and brachydactyly. But what was interesting is that in the heterozygous relatives, so the parents um, and the heterozygous siblings who have carry one copy of this mutation, their bones appeared normal, and instead they had what looked like idiopathic short stature. Um, and a number of groups have then gone on to look at how common are these heterozygous variants in NPR2 as a cause of idiopathic short stature. And what they found was that approximately 2% of individuals with idiopathic short stature have a pathologic mutation in NPR2. That's pretty common. You know, around one in 50 ISS patients could be due to NPR2 mutations. And on the flip side, Going back to that idea of a spectrum of genetic variants, there are patients with activating mutations in the NPR2 gene who have very tall stature. They might have some musculoskeletal issues, but are otherwise relatively healthy. We and others went on to ask the question about what percentage of patients with familial short stature have mutations in NPR2. Because again, if it's only heterozygous, then one parent uh, should carry a copy of it and also have short stature. And in a study that we performed looking at 99 children with ISS for whom a parental height was available, 22 of them had familial short stature with a parent also with a height below minus two standard deviations. And three of those had NPR2 mutations for a rate of around 14%. Of course, these are small numbers. In a larger study from the Czech Republic, they had 747 children treated with growth hormone of whom 87 had familial short stature. And of those, 6% had NPR2 mutations. So compared to 2% in the general ISS population, now if you just take patients who also have a parent with short stature, you get up to a rate of you know, somewhere in the 6 to 
But why am I focusing on this pathway? Well, I'm focusing on it because a number of uh, companies are developing therapeutics that target that pathway. So there's a medication now called Vesoratide. It was originally called BMN111, um, which uh, is a C-type natriuretic peptide analog, or um, which and stimulates that NPR2 receptor. And in a mouse model of achondroplasia, this medication, Vesoratide, was able to uh, rescue the phenotype of achondroplasia in the mouse and improve growth. And based on that, uh, this drug went through trials, phase one, phase two, and then phase three studies. The phase three study was published in The Lancet in 2020. This was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial comparing vasoratide to placebo in children with achondroplasia and showed that it did in fact increase the growth rate in children with achondroplasia of it by an average of around 1.6 centimeters per year, uh, which looks like a small gain, but if sustained over multiple years, which it appears to be doing right now, uh, that could lead to significant gains in height. And the picture on the right is just showing that this was true for all subgroups in the trial. So I and my group here at Children's National are now trying to use that vasoratide, that CNP analog, for other genetic causes of short stature. And we're running a phase two study um, looking at children with hypochondroplasia who have milder mutations in the FGFR3 gene, patients theoretically who have CNP deficiency. Now we haven't found any of those. It's a very rare condition. Patients with heterozygous mutations in the NPR2 gene, uh, thinking that we can augment and improve growth in those individuals. Patients with rasopathy, such as Noonan syndrome, which is also this direct pathway uh, that CNP interacts with. Shox gene mutations and agrican deficiency, as patients with agrican deficiency are also have increased levels of signaling through this pathway. And our study is uh, looking at 35 subjects between the ages of three and 11 for boys, 10 for girls who are prepubertal, have a height below minus 2.25 standard deviation deviations and have a documented mutation in one of these categories. There's a six month run-in period where we uh, get a baseline growth velocity followed by a year of therapy. Vesoratide is a daily subcutaneous injection. We currently, as I said, the study is currently closed in recruitment with 35 subjects, 26 of whom have hypochondroplasia, three with Noonan syndrome, three with agrican gene mutations, and three with NPR2 mutations. And just to give a little teaser, here is preliminary data from six-month results from the first 12 subjects. Um, and you see on the left, the children with hypochondroplasia, most of whom had a pretty good response with a mean increase in growth velocity of 1.8 centimeters per year. And this has uh, borne out at the 12-month uh, mark as well, um, showing similar results to what was seen for achondroplasia. But in my mind, what's really remarkable is the patients with Noonan syndrome and NPR2 gene mutations, where you're seeing growth velocities of close to 10 centimeters per year or even higher for most of the patients, and an increase of over six centimeters per year with vasoratide treatment. So more to come on that in the future, but really exciting preliminary results. So I would just posit for you that idiopathic short stature is actually going to be subdivided into many different genetic causes, um, such as agrican, NPR2, FGFR3, and so on and so forth. Um, and many of these might have additional medical comorbidities. Now, let's talk about genetic testing in this group of patients referred for short stature. So this was a study in 2018, um, looking at 565 uh, children referred to a specialized growth clinic in Germany, um, where they had both genetics and endocrinology. And in their traditional diagnostic yield, which included uh, many uh, microarrays and targeted testing, they found a cause in 13.6%. They then took 200 of the people who did not have a cause and did exome sequencing in them and found an additional yield in those individuals of 16.5%. And when you do the math, that means they would find a diagnosis in approximately a third of patients if they went all the way through exome sequencing. And interestingly, heterozygous carriers of skeletal dysplasias represented around 3%, including close to 2% of agrican and NPR2 mutations. 
Um, so uh, pointing again to this subdivision of the ISS categories. And hot off the presses just published this year, this was really a very beautifully done paper um, from China with uh, looking at 814 children with a height below minus two standard deviations. Plus they had some additional feature, which I'll show you in the next slide, or had isolated short stature with a height below minus three standard deviations. And of those patients, um, 330 underwent whole exome sequencing and 484 had this inherited disease panel with 2,742 gene. And the yield was pretty similar between the two approaches. And overall in the cohort, they found a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in 44% of the cohort. Um, and what was great though, was that they subdivided it into these different uh, clinical categories uh, based on, you know, they had small numbers of patients with growth hormone deficiency or multiple pituitary hormone deficiency or growth hormone sensitivity, but larger numbers in some of these other groups. And to focus in, if you had other congenital anomalies or dysmorphic features, the yield was 56%. If you had a clear skeletal dysplasia, the yield was 65%. And if you had associated intellectual disability or developmental delay, the yield was 70%. So those had very high likelihood of genetic uh, conditions with large numbers in the cohort. However, if you had a height below minus three SD with no additional phenotype, the yield was only 11%, which is still helpful, right? You know, one in 10 of the patients, one in nine of the patients, you could find a cause, that's helpful, um, but not nearly as high as what you're seeing with these other more syndromic uh, conditions. And in the SGA patients, the yield was only 24%. But the study did not look at methylation and epigenetics, which I'll show you more in the next slide. And on the bottom right, you see all the different genes that were involved in that uh, middle column, the defects in paracrine signaling. There were 31 patients with FGFR3. So those are probably the achondroplasia, the hypochondroplasia patients. Um, but interestingly, in the bottom left, in the extracellular matrix, again, you see six patients with aggregate gene mutations. And in the top right, in the intracellular signaling pathway, 24 patients with PTPN11 mutations, which is Noonan syndrome, and a number of the restopathies there. So uh, again, these same themes, these pathways are, are being hit uh, in the patients with short stature. This paper also, I think, is a fascinating paper published in uh, 2021 looking at patients born who were referred for testing for being small, born small for gestational age with persistent short stature, or specifically for testing for uh, silver Russell syndrome. And they confirmed that patients were in fact small for gestational age, had persistent short stature, that got them to a cohort of 269 patients, um, 20 of whom ended up having pathogenic copy number variants. And then they had 249, who they did further testing on. And they divided them into patients who based on clinical score looked like Silver Russell versus patients who did not and either had macrocephaly or microcephaly. The microcephaly group was only seven patients, so we won't talk about that. In the patients who looked like they had Silver Russell syndrome, a genetic cause of Silver Russell was found in 30%, but 14% of them also had a different imprinting disorder which was only able to be found because they did these uh, multi-locus methylation tests. And in the non-Silver Russell, the patients where the clinical score looked negative, an additional 14% of them had uh, a genetic cause of Silver Russell confirmed, um, and 7% had other imprinting disorders, really showing you that in this SGA population, you really need to look broadly at methylation patterns to look for all of these different uh, imprinting disorders. And one last study to share. Uh, this is a study only of 33 patients, but patients with severe familial short stature where both the child and the parent had to have a height below minus 2.5 standard deviations. And they found a genetic etiology in 52%. And half of them, again, were located at the growth plate. So in conclusion, variants in the same gene may have a range of effects across a spectrum an individual's height is determined by the combination of many different genetic variants. Many of the genes involved are not classical endocrine genes. They're either skeletal or growth plate genes. ISS is going to be subdivided into many new diagnostic bins, 
And I believe that in the future, we will be using targeted therapeutics based on underlying genetic mutations. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I hope that at some point we will be able to do this again in person.